a little bit of housekeeping to begin with. Uh, if you would all mute when uh, Taylor and Cindy will be speaking. Uh, if you have a question while they're speaking, you can write it in the chat. I don't know if you know what the chat is, but somewhere down there, you can write it in the chat. Um, and uh, then they will be monitoring that. Taylor and Cindy will be monitoring that so they can ask questions or read your question. Uh, they will stop in between presentation topics and give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, remember to unmute when you want to ask a question. And if you want to raise your hand, that's usually the the easiest way to be recognized. Uh, and that's that little palm down at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, it pops up like I just did that shows that I raised my hand if you have a question that you don't want to write in the chat. Uh, this is this is being recorded and we've actually had people who said they couldn't be here today. So uh, if that's okay with Cindy and Taylor, we are recording it and people will be wanting to watch that. We'll make the link available at the end of the, once it's uh, finished up with George, bless his heart. Uh, so today I want to introduce uh, Cindy Rizzese, did I do right, Cindy? Absolutely perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And Taylor Murray, Cindy uh, is the executive director and uh, clinical ethicist at Vermont Ethics Network and clinical ethicist at UVM Medical Center. And Taylor Murray is our statewide advanced planning program manager. And we are so uh, happy to have the two of them here today to talk about a topic that is so important in our lives, especially at this point, or at any point, actually. So thank you, Cindy and Taylor, please. And if everyone would, would mute at this point as we begin. Great. Thanks, everyone. I wish I could have produced a nice, oh, actually, I lied because the blue sky is just now coming out where I live. It was sleeting, uh, like kind of slushy rain when I went for a walk earlier with my dog. But now the blue sky is out, of course, because I'm inside. Um, so thanks for joining, inviting us to be part of this call today or to be on this call today and for your interest in uh, learning more about planning for future healthcare needs. Since we have a relatively small group, I just was curious and wanted to just spend a minute or two just opening it up to see if there's if people had any particular burning questions that they were really hoping to have answered today. That way, Taylor and I can be sure that we address those. We may have it already planned to talk about in the in the course of our presentation today, but I just wanted to make sure that if there was a particular question that you were that you've been thinking about and something that you were hoping to definitely get answered in the course of today's presentation, if if anyone wants to just unmute and let us know what that is, uh, we can either do you can just unmute yourself and and ask your question, and I'll make a note of it so I'm sure to cover that those topics. Um, if they're not already kind of baked into what we were planning. So does anyone have any particular question they were really hoping to have answered today relative to advanced directives, medical decision-making, healthcare ethics, any of the above? <laughs> uh, Martha. I, I do. Um, so my partner and I have a, have a lawyer filled out and papers and little cards and all of that. But my question is, how do how do people know where that is? So I went to all this trouble, and now I'm lying in the bed, and nobody knows. So how do how how do you make sure that people know where those papers are or whatever? Okay, great. We'll definitely be talking about that today, in terms of making sure people have access to the documents when they're most needed, obviously. And generally that's when you can't speak for yourself. So it becomes hugely important to make sure they're in the right place because if we could ask you, we wouldn't be need, we wouldn't need to be looking at the document, right? Great question. Any other questions that people were really hoping to have answered when it comes to planning ahead or the unexpected? Paul? Oh. Looks like we're having some trouble with your audio, Paul. I am not. Is it just me or is Oh, you're a duck. Oh, you're sounding like a duck. <laughs> There's something going on with your audio, Paul. It sounds very warbled. 
Uh, well, it, well, it may be better to type the question in the chat if you if you're comfortable doing that. Yeah. Any other questions? We've learned to be nimble and fluid when it comes to technology because even though it's been great, it's also sometimes doesn't, isn't our friend and doesn't work. <laughs> okay, looks like Paul is typing his question in and um, we will keep track of that and make sure we, we build the response into his question once we get it. I think for now we'll start off with, uh, did you have something Taylor to say? Sure, I just, I see one other point that Amy was hoping that we would address and I see Paul's question as well. So Amy's hoping that we might talk some more about how dementia or uh, related mental issues can affect whole end of life planning. We can certainly talk about that. Um, and then how do we go about choosing someone to take charge when the time comes? That's Paul's question. And that is a main theme for us today. So I feel that both of those will be addressed. Absolutely. All right. And if other questions come up along the way, uh, we, you know, type them into the chat or raise your hand and we will keep this as we're a relatively small group so we can hopefully have more of a discussion than just a facilitator led presentation. All right. So let me see if I can share my screen here so that everybody can see it. My entire screen. Uh, this is the one I want to share. All right. Let me know if you're seeing that once it's okay everyone's seeing that it says no crystal ball planning for future healthcare needs excellent all righty so let's just dive right in here i gotta get my here we go so i guess the way to the one of the things to talk about i think right off the right off the bat is that this idea of planning for future healthcare needs it's really about you know the fact that there are these kind of two big unfixables in medicine right dr gawandi who is was based out of harvard wrote this amazing book back in i think it was 2014 or 2016 called being mortal and where he just kind of stated, I think what we all know, but we, we don't really talk about it very much, which is that we can't really fix aging. It, it's going to happen. We can't stop time or roll the clock back. And we can't fix dying. Dying is one of those things that we try to avoid. I think we do a lot of things to keep people healthy and well, but eventually dying will happen. And so because these things are basically, we can't stop them, we can't prevent them, then what we need to do is plan, plan for what, we're, what, what matters to us as we age or when we think death may be coming or in the event that there's something unexpected happens, what do people need to know in order to be able to take good care of us? And so I think that's really kind of the focus of our talk today, which is how do we just plan for the inevitable, even though it may not be tomorrow and we hope it's not tomorrow, we hope it's some long time off in the future. So advanced care planning, which is sort of that general catch-all term that we use to refer to this kind of idea of thinking about and planning for some future healthcare needs, is just that. It's this process that we go through or we should be going through of having conversations, trying to kind of think for ourselves what, what matters to us most, what are our values, what are the things that give life meaning, are there circumstances or situations we'd like to avoid, sharing that information with people who are close to us, um, figuring out who those people who are in our circle of friends and family would be good decision makers if for some reason we weren't able to make decisions for ourselves, and then documenting that someplace so that it's there as a reference and as a legal document so that if the circumstance arises where we're unable to speak for ourselves, we have the ability to, as healthcare providers, to look to some previously stated wishes and goals and try to implement that into the plan of care so that what we're trying to do ultimately is to ensure that the care and treatment that you want is actually what you get. I think so often people just get on what I like to call the medical train, right? Where you, you're in the hospital and there's a lot of things happening all at once. And people are saying, we could do this, we should do that. 
And the next thing you know, you find yourself in a situation where you're like, wait a minute, I'm not sure that this is really what I want. Or your family is like, hold on a second. We didn't think that this is what it was going to look like. How are we how are we able to ensure that what we're doing is actually in alignment with goals that you have for yourself? And that's really what advanced care planning is all about. So one of the things that's important to remember, and I think it goes back to Dr. Gawande's book, is that there's sort of this natural progression that happens in life, right? We get older. Um, we may have existing chronic diseases that, that march along and progress. We may have new issues, new health issues, new chronic illnesses, maybe an acute illness, something that happens along the way. That's just part of life. It's sort of how things go. And as we age, as these diseases march along or as new health issues arise, arise, there's new management needs, right? There's things we need to think about that we hadn't thought about before in terms of how do I stay healthy and functional and continue to do the things that are important to me. And I think to the point that someone asked around um, cognitive issues as well, sometimes when it comes to the progression of an illness like dementia or Alzheimer's, we may see um, behavioral issues that come up as a function of just the brain not, it has a disease process that's unfolding and it's affecting not just our ability to think and act clearly, but sometimes it may be affecting behaviors. And so when those things are happening, how do we, how are we nimble? How are we able to make sure that we're meeting the needs of this person or having our needs met the way we would like? The other thing that happens is things get more complex. As we move along, things become more challenging, uh, more complicated. So I think we need to be prepared along the way for acute issues that could happen. The sudden and unexpected thing, if I think COVID has certainly helped us or keyed us into the fact that sudden and unexpected acute illness can happen to any of us. And so are we prepared for that? Um, as care management changes, as people develop new things or multiple chronic illnesses? Do we know how to manage all of those things at once? And do we have a plan for what that needs to look like and how the plan maybe needs to change from what it was last year to what it needs to be next year? And ideally, what would be happening is we'd be having these conversations with those people closest to us and with the medical, our medical providers all along the way, and we'd be modifying our priorities, right? Because we know as we get older, what's important to us kind of changes. What was important to me when I was 30 and I had young babies is, is different now that I'm in my 50s and my kids are grown and out of the house. Our priorities change and the people that are around us also change. Um, so I think it's important to keep that in mind. So I'm a big fan of kind of thinking about planning in the context of what do we need to do right now? And I think one of the missteps maybe that advanced care planning and even advanced directives when we talk about the tools um, has, have made is that we try to do everything all at once. And that doesn't always work for people. It's very difficult to imagine circumstances that are so far removed from anything you could even really consider for yourself. That try, being asked to answer those questions now sometimes just feels so hard that it just stops people from doing any advanced care planning. So I'm a really big fan of just like, where are we right now and what are the needs that we need to be thinking about now and maybe over the next few years? Not trying to think so far ahead into the future that it becomes almost impossible to predict. So what's most important as you age? What are the things that people need to know about you as you're getting older that would help them make good decisions on your behalf if you couldn't speak for yourself? Um, what happens if you get so sick that you can't speak at all. Do doctors know? Does the team know? Does your family know who is authorized to make decisions on your behalf? What if you have an illness like dementia where you know your cognitive capabilities are going to decline over time? That's a function of that particular disease process. So have we planned for that by making sure that there is somebody in place when that time comes so that there's a seamless transition and we're continuing to make good decisions that are very centered on what matters most to you? Where and how do you want your care needs to be met as you age or as illnesses progress? Are you comfortable with not living in your own home and maybe going to assisted or long-term care? Are those, or is the prospect of that just so not, not an option as far as you're concerned in your own values that you would prefer shorter time um, as long as it can be 
time that's spent independently. Um, those are really person and individual centric choices. They're not things that someone can decide in advance. I mean, for you, if, if possible, I think it happens all the time, but it would be so much nicer if we knew the, the acceptable things and the trade-offs that people were willing to make and the things that were totally not acceptable. So then we can map out a plan of care that really does focus on what matters to that individual. And maybe ideally you'd like to live at home as long as possible, but if that's not, or, or until, until you die and have hospice, but what if that's not an option? What if whatever's happening to you doesn't make that possible? Then what? What do people need to know um, in order to ensure that we're doing the very best we can? What is the plan if something sudden or unexpected happens? Like, do we have that sort of in the moment, uh-oh, we didn't think about this thing. Do we know what to do when something unexpected happens? And also, how should the plan shift if it turns out that time is shorter than we'd all hoped? What are the priorities then? These are the kinds of questions that I think people need to ask of themselves, but also if you're working with loved ones, ask of them. So if you're in the position of having to make decisions for someone else, these are the kinds of ans answers to these kinds of questions will make that job, I think, a lot easier. Any questions at all about sort of the planning piece, the process of planning? I wanna make sure we um, touch base on that. We're gonna dive more into the tools shortly, but I wanna make sure we talk about this idea of planning in advance. I think to Amy's question, um, Amy, you had, you had typed into the chat about dementia or other related mental health, mental issues that can affect end of life planning. So dementia is an interesting one because we don't really know um, how long, right? Or how fast it will progress. It's very, very different from one individual to another. So I think there's a couple ways to think about that, which is one, living with dementia, which is when you're still, in, you know you have this illness um, and you know that it is chronic and progressive, but you're doing the things you want to do now and it's fine. So how do you live with dementia? And then the other is that dementia eventually does reach an end stage. And so then the other piece is dying with dementia and what should that look like? So sometimes I think it's helpful to think about it in two different ways. Living with the illness as it's progressing and maybe you're getting some functional decline or some cognitive decline and, and working with your clinician and your care team and your family to talk about what may be coming down the pike and good, good plans to put in place for that. And then there's the end stage of the illness, which it will reach an end stage eventually, and talking about what that could look like or should look like for you to make sure that it shapes, it's, it's, it's hopefully unfolding in a way that is reflective of what matters to you. I think that advanced directives are good tools to be able to do both of those things. And there are some really good resources on the Vermont Ethics Network website that are very specific to dementia. There's a few um, documents that are out there, dementia-specific directives that can certainly be used as addendums to your um, existing advanced directive that can give a little bit more kind of disease-specific information, depending on where you are in the early stages, mid stages, or late stages of that process. So I would I would definitely recommend looking at those tools. And certainly you can always add those as separate attachments to an existing advanced directive if that's something you want to communicate very specifically in terms of your, your wishes and your values. So hopefully that helps. That does help. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I think we, I'm, I always think of a person in a hospital bed, you know, unable to communicate after some catastrophic illness. But actually I think what happens more often is that you know, a person's body might be very sound, but, you know, their decision making and communication may not be um, what it once was. So that's definitely something that's um, on my mind when I think about how to start planning for the end of life. Yeah, I think that what you're raising is a really good point about sort of how people die. Um, I think it used to be that people developed a sudden illness and then they died really quickly because we didn't really have the technology to be able to sustain people or to cure illness, right? We just didn't have that. So it used to be that people kind of 
they were doing well, then they had an then they had an event, and then the trajectory to end of life was actually a steep, you know, it was a steep drop off right to when they died. Now, I think because of technology, because we are so good at um, all of like preventative care and ongoing care and supportive care, you see people actually kind of have this, this, they call it the dwindles, I guess, in the literature where they just are going along and then they have something happens and then they get back kind of close to where they were before, but not exactly. And then they continue to decline, but it's very slow. And then they have some issue, a hospitalization, a fall, um, an event like a stroke or something happens and they take a little dip and then we get them back almost to where they were before, but not quite. And then they continue. It's a slow kind of trajectory. And I think that is complicated. And so planning for those kinds of things. And dementia is one of those ones that can look very slow because of what you just raised, that sometimes people's physical health is quite good, but their cognition is failing. And so what happens when that as that as the brain continues to fail because it has a disease state that is incurable, um, we do end up with other things happening, like they're not people aren't able to swallow. And so, how do how do we have conversations in advance about some of those end stage um, situations that arise and and how best to manage that? So we're optimizing what's most important for the individual and minimizing doing things that won't help and may only actually add burden and, and increase suffering. Um, so I think sometimes we think about it as, is are we prolonging living or are we prolonging dying? And I think it's a subtle kind of a distinction, but it is different. It is different. Um, and I think that's defined by the values and the priorities of the person who's experiencing um, that particular illness and, and, and how they would like their end, the end stage to come. So hopefully that helps. Uh, yes, thank you. That was very helpful. I would like to just add something that I'm a full-time caregiver of my husband who has dementia. And um, he's at a point where he doesn't have um, very much language. So it's important to um, be able to read facial expressions. Um, sometimes he his language consists of repeating whatever it was you said or somebody said, um, and then once in a while, he will come out with a full sentence, uh, which is totally appropriate to whatever is going on. So I can't um, really emphasize how important it is to know the individual and the bit about living with dementia, because it's, it is a slow process. And as Cindy was saying, you go up and then you go down and then there's a long plateau. So it's, um, yeah, you have to have a lot of patience. And my husband is very healthy, probably more so than I am. Um, but um, he has almost no short-term memory. And uh, the long-term isn't much isn't much better. We have all the advanced directives and have done everything that's been in place for quite a few years. Um, and he's only need this needed this kind of care for the last year. I mean, he um, he can't do very much by himself unless you are there and directing. Now put your pants on. Now put your belt on. You know, everything has to be step by step. But you can still enjoy his life, your life, the time you have together. And that's what's really, really critical to um, find things. He likes to go for drives. So we're all, and I like to bird. So we go someplace where we're out and about. I can bird, he can sit in the car, or if it's nice, he can, you know, sit in a chair outside. But living with it is really important because you don't see the end. The end is uh, a really distant future. Mm -hmm. I could thank you. I could talk for hours, but I won't. Well, thank you for sharing that and your experience. I think it's so helpful um, to hear from people who are who are living, living what it means to have a, a family member and a loved one who's experiencing this particular diagnosis and and how it looks. And it's different for every family and for every individual. And I think developing support systems are hugely important. 
having conversations before there's loss of, of language skills and other types of cognitive skills so that people feel confident that when they're called to make decisions, they feel like, okay, I, we talked about this. I know, I know this is the right decision. And I think one of the things that that's so important and valuable about advanced care planning, the conversations and the process, as much as the documents, is that I think it does give people some peace of mind when difficult decisions come up and they're they're not left sitting there scratching their head thinking, geez, I wonder if this was the right choice. I wonder if I did the right thing. I mean, all the people that I've spoken with who've who've had to make difficult decisions for someone else and they've had advanced directives have said, honestly, it was still hard. It, you can't make it easy, but it it was so, I, I don't have any regrets. I don't feel like, oh, I'm plagued by wondering if I did the right thing because we talked about all of this and we put things down in writing and it just made decisions that we knew would come up. It made them a bit easier because I wasn't left wondering as opposed to people who said, you know, who, and I think a lot of times it's the motivator often for doing advanced care planning and have, and doing documents is either you had a great experience and it really made things so much easier or conversely, it was a real challenge. And I did a workshop uh, a couple of years ago where someone came up to me and she said she was still haunted by some of the decisions she was asked to make for her spouse when, um, because they'd never had any conversations about any of it. And she still is kind of haunted a bit by whether or not she made the right choice. And I think that's really difficult. So often I think just having these conversations is, it's a gift, right? It's a gift to your family. It's a gift to your loved ones to help them navigate complex decision-making when the stakes are high and our emotions are high, and maybe what we want for the person is a little bit different than what they've said they want for themselves. And I think it gives us some comfort in knowing we're honoring what's important to them. It's really not fair to either one not to have those conversations beforehand. It is critical, and there are things that you know we've discussed for years. We thought it was really important. But with dementia, it's totally different because what you said you wanted um, is not, um, in other words, um, David would not want to be like this. He would not want to be, um, I use the word burden. It's not a burden, but um, it, uh, my time is not my own. Um, mm -hmm. And he would not want that. But now... You have a different mindset when you have dementia. So I can make those decisions. I know what he would like, but, you know, I can't do anything about it. He's not terminal um, any more than the rest of us are. So <laughs> it's um, it's difficult, but I think it's much easier. And you don't have the guilt level um, if you are the one that has to make some final or difficult decisions. I think it's really important to talk about it beforehand. Yeah, thanks, Luann. And I think what you're highlighting is this, the process, right? It's an ongoing process. And and I think it's why we have to keep revisiting these things because because I do think our goals change. I do think situations that we we thought we would never find acceptable, when we, when we met with that situation, we kind of think again, we think, well, actually, this isn't so bad. I can still enjoy doing these things and I'm still getting enjoyment and, uh, and, and living as a full life. And maybe you couldn't have contemplated that five years ago or 10 years ago because it was so far out of what you were experiencing. So it's, I think it highlights the importance of having to revisit conversations, revisit decisions, revisit situations, and also to include your healthcare provider, particularly if you have chronic illness or progressive illness or illness for which we know there is no cure. Um, we have a sense, I think those healthcare providers know kind of how the disease unfolds. They may not be able to give you the timeline exactly, but they can certainly let you know some milestones along the way. And that can be decision points depending upon people's goals and values. And I think it's really important to have those kind of disease specific conversations with a healthcare provider who knows you and who knows your health history and who understands sort of the way a particular illness will unfold and can give you some tips and also tell you where the decision points are gonna come so that you're prepared. 
Um, and it doesn't make it necessarily easier when you have to make the decision, but it certainly gives you time to process um, and to have conversations ahead of time. So the process is equally as important, I think, as the tools. So we've got this, the need to have conversation, and I think Luann highlighted so well and eloquently why it is so important and such a gift to, to your loved ones to have had these conversations before we lose the ability to communicate with somebody due to a progressive illness like dementia or something else, or a sudden illness where, you know, there's no time like the present to have these conversations because you don't know. A sudden illness and accident can happen to anyone at any time, regardless of your age and regardless of your baseline health. None of us are immune from having something sudden and unexpected happen that takes away our ability to make decisions for ourselves, even if it's temporarily. And so making sure that we've done some kind of planning to prepare for that, what we hope won't ever happen, but easily could, um, is hugely important. And that's why we kind of have this continuum, if you will, of advanced care planning that, that kind of outlines the tools along the way as we're having these conversations. So you can see over here, we know that um, people will go from being quite healthy and then they'll, they'll develop illnesses and eventually they'll reach end of life, right? I mean, that's just, that's true for all of us. We don't know exactly how long this will take, but it's the trajectory for everyone. And conversations should be happening all along the way. And we have opportunities to document things as we're traveling this path, right? We have opportunities to document who makes decisions as well as what those decisions should be as our health changes and as new needs emerge along the way. So I wanna kick it over to Taylor to talk a little bit more about the actual documentation um, and the tools that we have available to document people's priorities for future healthcare needs. Thanks, Cindy. Um, I'm, I'm the queen of forms here at the Vermont Ethics Network. Um, if you call and you want to know about a form, you end up talking to me. So we'll start with the very basic form. It's really one page front and back, and it is just designed to appoint a healthcare agent. We've talked a lot about having conversations and how important that is, but it can be really difficult and feel very uh, final to write down those decisions in a directive. So many people want to start with just appointing the person. You know, this is the person I've been talking to about decisions. They're the one who's going to be able to make those choices. And so we want to just appoint that person as the agent. And we have a form that's just for that. Uh, and the healthcare agent themselves, right? This is the person who's going to be making decisions for you if you cannot speak for yourself. That person needs to be an adult over 18. Um, they should be someone that you trust, right? Just because someone wants to be your agent doesn't mean they're a good agent. You need to want them to be your agent. You need to trust them with the decision. Trust that if they were forced to make a decision, they would think about what matters to you, not what matters to them. Will they be able to ask questions of your care team? And will they then be able to turn around and say to your doctors, no, he wouldn't have wanted that, or absolutely, she absolutely would have wanted that. Will they be able to advocate for you? So these are the things I would encourage you to think about when you think about picking an agent, right? Um, someone who's passionate about healthcare is great. You may have a niece who's a nurse or a cousin who's a doctor, but make sure that you trust those people to make decisions um, and you actually have had the conversations with them. Uh, so that's step one pick an agent and we can appoint them all by themselves, or you can go steps further and also complete an advanced directive that also appoints a healthcare agent. I think that's our next slide. Yep, I just wanna say one thing about the healthcare agent. Um, and you may hear of this person referred to by different names. We used to actually in Vermont call a healthcare agent a durable power of attorney for healthcare. And I still hear a lot of my colleagues in the hospital use that term, DPOA, DPOA, and people call me up and say, I'm the power of attorney. So it's really important to distinguish powers of attorney for finances from powers of attorney for healthcare. There, it's, if, some, if you've named someone as your power of attorney um, for finances, it doesn't automatically give them any authority to make healthcare decisions. So you have to explicitly complete some type of documentation um, about who this person can 
uh, I mean, about medical decisions, right? So it's either, it used to be a power of attorney for healthcare, and now we call it um, a healthcare agent. Some states call it a healthcare proxy. It's, they're synonyms for the same thing. The person that an individual named to be legally authorized to make medical decisions on their behalf if they're unable. I, I saw a question from Amy about, does your agent have to be one single person? So Taylor, do you want to take that or do you want me to answer it? Sure. Um, your agent does not have to be one single person. It is possible to appoint what we call co-agents, two people or three people to make decisions as a team together. Um, and then it's also possible and encouraged for you to appoint an alternate agent, right? If, if this person, your one eight first primary agent is not able to speak for you or is not accessible, who's the other person we could go to if we need to? So you can go co-agents, you can go primary and then alternate agents. The one caution I think we would always want to give about co-agents is that when you appoint co-agents, you are asking them to make decisions together. So they absolutely need to be on the same page about what your wishes are. And it can become very complex if co-agents disagree about what your decision would be in that circumstance. So jumping back to conversations, right? regardless of who or how many agents you appoint, you have to have the conversations with all of them and keep everybody on the same page about your goals. Um, so yes, you can have more than one person be your agent, but make sure that everybody who's appointed is involved in the conversations. Yep, and the only thing I would say is I've seen it work really well in some families um, where they've had multiple agents. There's kind of safety in numbers right? So it's kind of nice to have a person that is with you, right? That's helping, you're making decisions together, as Taylor said, in a team. And you're speaking in one voice, but you're working collaboratively to get to that, to that point of that decision. It's also not been a complete failure in other instances where people are fighting back and forth. And, and when we're in the hospital and we've got a person who's ill and can't speak up for themselves, and we're having to navigate a lot of family conflict, um, that sort of detracts from trying to focus on the needs of the individual. So we have to spend more time and, and to get to try to get people to come together. And, you know, like less than 5% of situations turn into some intractable dispute. We generally can get people together. Um, it just means that the individual, the patient, is perhaps experiencing more burdensome treatment than they would have wanted. Um, and that's that's something that's that's challenging, right? So just I think I can't highlight enough Taylor's comments about making sure people are speaking in one voice, and that. Um, but I think ultimately, you know your people, right? You know your people, and if your people can work well together, then by all means, safety in numbers and set it up that way. But if you know that people tend to kind of go rogue. That, and, and they're more likely to be combative with one another or, or things will get complicated than set up some sort of a hierarchy instead. Um, and, but again, it, it all defaults back to having those good conversations. Let me go to the next slide here. There you go. Right, and, and this is a slide that's specific to the advanced directive that goes beyond just appointing a healthcare agent. So. In the very first part of the document, you appoint your healthcare agent, formerly called durable power of attorney for healthcare, or sometimes called a healthcare proxy. Uh, and that part one of pretty much all advanced directives is where you start. You pick your people, assign them their roles, be that co-agents or a hierarchy. And then we would move on to parts two and three, where you're going to provide as much information as you can about your care goals, your values, your preferences for treatment, and we're going to talk more in a couple slides about the pitfalls and good questions to ask yourself. Uh, but this is a, a good place to express to your healthcare agents and to your doctors, you know, these are the things that I absolutely would want you to do in my care. And then these are things I would never want you to do. Here are circumstances that I have thought about, right? I have thought about the reality of me potentially getting a di dementia diagnosis. Here's what I would want to have happen if that were the case. Um, and this is the best place for you to be reflective about things you have experienced or seen um, and to talk about your experiences and what is valuable to you. My life is, has value to me when I'm able to do X, Y, Z things. 
Um, and this is also the place that we would encourage people to revisit often, right? When you have a, a, a new diagnosis, when um, you have a new experience that changes your perspective, this is the, a part to come back to in your advanced directive uh, to keep thinking about your goals and how they might change. Um, anything you want to add, Cindy, about parts two and three? No, I think, I mean, I think parts two and three really are just as Taylor, Taylor said, designed to really capture what's important to you. I will say about part three, which is the one, it's the section on our short form um, that kind of gives, gets people hung up sometimes because it does ask specific questions about treatments, treatments that um, you're likely to experience if you're in an intensive care unit, um, such as being intubated, having a machine to breathe for you. Um, if that goes on for a very long period of time, they may talk about, you know, cutting a hole into the neck of the person so that they can do a tracheostomy and, and breathe that way so you don't have the tube going down their, the back of their throat. And well, when you do that, then there's this idea that if they can't eat that way. So now we have to think about a feeding tube. So there are questions on the advanced directive short form and the long form, and we can talk about the various different forms on our website um, at the end. But I, um, I guess I encourage people, I think when you have disease specific considerations where these kinds of interventions are likely to come up because of the way a disease process unfolds, where we, we know that you'll eventually not be able to swallow. Um, dysphagia is a common problem that comes up with people that as, as their Alzheimer's or dementia is advancing. Um, it's, it's not unheard of for people to lose the ability to kind of swallow for themselves. And so the question of feeding tubes comes up. So these are the kinds of conversations I would encourage you to have with the healthcare provider to talk about your specific needs, a particular illness, and whether or not these things make sense to do in light of your goals. Um, and I'm a big fan of kind of not getting too in the weeds with specific treatments, but focusing more on the goal. Because depending on the goal, some treatments may not even make sense. Right. Like if I, I did a we did an ethics consult once for an individual who was was very ill and was approaching end of life. And and he had some cognitive delay issues, but he was very clear that he wanted didn't want to go to the hospital like he was aware that death happened. He lived on a farm his whole life. His, his parents had died. His brother had died. Even his dog had died. The, the farm animals died. He was very familiar with dying. And he said he just doesn't want to go to the hospital. So we were having this long conversation about treatments like CPR. Do we resuscitate him if his heart stops? Do we take him to the hospital if he, got, if he gets pneumonia and put him on a breathing machine? And I mean, this long conversation, and all of a sudden, I don't know what took me so long, but all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said he doesn't want to go to the hospital. So why are we talking about any of these things? Because he's clearly going to have to be in the hospital for that. And all of a sudden, the decisions became so much more clear. We could get home-based palliative care to support him to live as fully as he could. He was in his 80s at home. We could have hospice come in. We could get a whole bunch of community supports and try to meet all of his care needs in his home because that was his priority. And all of this other stuff just kind of went away because his goal was to be on the farm, to live on the farm and die on the farm as his parents had done, as his brother had done. So all of a sudden, like all of this stuff was just distraction. And so I that has really taught me, I think, over the years that it's really important to focus on the goal and let the medical professionals tell you treatments change all the time, right? We're constantly coming up with new ways to prolong life or dying, depending on how you want to look at it. And there's let them tell you what tools they have in their toolbox to help you achieve the goal. Right. Because maybe some of these tools that we've put on a form no longer apply or they don't apply for this person based on the goals that they've identified. So I guess that's the only thing I would add to when you're looking when you're thinking about goals and you're looking at treatment preferences, you know, don't it's OK not to fill out a whole section on specific treatments. If you don't want to just draw a line through it and say, I don't you know, this is the goal. My agent will work with my healthcare providers and they'll figure out what along that huge list of treatments we the, the hospital has available to me, what makes sense for the goals that I've outlined are most important. So that's what I would add. Thank you. Are, are you, excuse me, it's Lou Ann. Um, are you going to talk about do not resuscitate? 
Yes. Yes, we will. We'll talk about those. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Of course. Um, and, and before we get to do not resuscitate, which is something that we'll get to the next in the next slide, I believe. Um, in the advanced directive, part four allows you to instruct your agents and people who are involved in your care on any arrangements that you may have made and any wishes that you have about what should happen after you die. Right? Would you like to be an organ donor? Well, rather, have, are you an organ donor? You should indicate that on your directive so people know. Any funeral arrangements you may have made, you can indicate that on your directive so people know. It. And funeral directors will all often ask us for directives to see what the person indicated as their goals. Um, and again, like Cindy said, you know, if you haven't done this, if you haven't thought about whether you want to be an organ donor or what kind of funeral you want or would you want to be cremated, that's fine. You can skip this section and you it's, there's a space to just say, my agent will decide or this person will decide for me. Um, this is just a place to, again, provide that more information about your goals and values to your family, specific to after death. Um, and, and this section is often skipped by people. We, we don't mind at all, <laughs> but it is there in our short form and our long form for people to rely on. Um, I think the most common question I get about this is, uh, what is a pre-need funeral contract? Um, and that is simply making a contract with a funeral home before you need it. Uh, and that there is a space to indicate that here as well. Uh, but again, if you haven't done that, it's not an admonishment or where no one's telling you to do it. It's simply a space for you to indicate things you may have already done uh, to help your family in that time. And then the last part of the directive, and probably the part that I think people struggle with the most in some circumstance is the signature and witnessing. And that's because there is a specific requirement in Vermont. Every state has their own requirements about signing and witnessing documents. But in Vermont, in order to be a valid advanced directive, it must be signed by you, the principal, and then two adult witnesses. There's no notary requirement. Don't let your lawyer tell you that you need a notary. You don't need a notary. What you do need are two witnesses. And there are restrictions on who can be witnesses to your directive. And I've, I've written them here, but witnesses cannot be a person who you've appointed as your healthcare agent. They cannot be your immediate family, like parents, siblings, children, or grandchildren. And they can be anyone else that you know and who knows you, including your doctor. So many people find it's very convenient to bring a completed advanced directive to a, an upcoming physician appointment. You can sign it in front of them and then your doctor and their office staff can serve as witnesses. Um, that can be very convenient. So that's the one sort of caveat to any advanced directive. In order to be legally valid, it must be signed and witnessed. Even if you use a form that we didn't produce, that doesn't, doesn't come from the state, even if you type up a letter that indicates what your values are, it has to be signed and witnessed to be a valid directive. Um, and I'll open up for any questions that people might have about completing the physical form here. Thanks, Taylor. One thing I will say about these forms is that, is certainly the forms that we produce at the Vermont Ethics Network, is that we've tried to kind of capture the common things, like the things that most people want to communicate about. So I think back to Taylor's point about, you know, you may not want to fill out every section. That's fine. You should feel free to customize these forms in a way that suits your needs. So if you're a person who likes to write in narrative form, that's fine. There's sections on the form that say additional comments. You could write, see attached narrative. And you could write 10 pages if you wanted. You could write whatever it is you want to write that speaks specifically to what's important to you that maybe isn't captured by some of the questions you saw on the form. So there's always opportunities to add additional pages. We talked a little bit earlier about these dementia directives. Some of them are out. Um, you can find them on the internet. Um, if you want to attach an addendum, like say you write, you just want to name a healthcare agent, you don't want to get into the weeds of all this other stuff because you've had conversations with your healthcare agent, but you have come to form some opinions around dementia specifically uh, because maybe you have a loved one, a family member or a parent that, that, um, that had dementia and it's given you some insight into things that you would want to see happen if that situation were to happen to you. Um, then you could just say, see attached dementia specific 
instructions, you know, and then you just attach a copy of whatever other documentation you want to include. Just make sure on the top of every additional page that you add, you put your name, your date of birth, and the date that you're completing the document so that when you send it to the registry or you give it to the healthcare providers, you we know that this is all one document, right? The signing and witnessing for this document, it all goes together. Uh, I think that just makes it a little bit easier, but please feel free to customize, the, customize these documents in a way that best suits your needs and best allows you to communicate what you want to communicate to the people that you want to, uh, you want to have the information go to. Um, absolutely. And, and I see one question from Paul in the chat about changing advanced directives. And we will talk more about this later. But what I will say now is that the best thing to do if you want to change what your advanced directive says is to do a new one. Because for, for one, any newer, more current advanced directive supersedes older directives, right? So if you did one in 2008 and you did one again in 2015, that 2015 document is the one that people are going to use. And I know it may feel tempting to want to cross things out and initial them or, or just uh, erase this and write someone else in. But there's two important legal considerations there. The first is that whenever you make a change to your advanced directive, that needs to be signed and witnessed, right? If you start editing, you're going to either have to have people do little signatures all over to sign and witness each change, or uh, sometimes changes are not signed and witnessed, and that can create a problem for future healthcare administration to you. So that's the first consideration, right? You want to make sure that every change you make is legally a part of your advanced directive. So to avoid the complex issues of signing tiny changes, the best thing to do is to do a new document where all of your current and accurate healthcare goals are represented. This also has benefit to when your care is administered using the directive, right? These are often tense situations, and sometimes they may feel emergent and or are emergent, and we want to use the directive to help direct your care. But if we have to go through five different advanced directives, each with little annotations on them, physicians are going to have a very difficult time interpreting what your current values are. What are the things that most recently you said you would want? So having one document that is accurate to everything you would like to have happen or not happen is the best way to make sure care is administered quickly <laughs> and the way you would want it. So it's no more difficult to change a directive than it is to do a new one, <laughs> uh, but it is not as simple as making small edits. Um, we really do recommend doing an entirely new document if you want to make changes, even if that means copying over a lot of information from a previous directive. Yeah, and I will just echo what Taylor is saying on the other end when I'm at the hospital. I've been called to do ethics consults to help figure out what, what a document actually says. Be, and, and in, you know, where it's been updated multiple times or there's just initials and dating after each thing. So then you're trying to go through the document and try to figure out. I mean, it, it no longer becomes a legally binding document when once there's this, the signing and witnessing only applies to a portion of it, right? I mean, it, all of a sudden it becomes, but as an ethicist, it still carries moral weight, right? We still want to do our best to make sure that the care and treatment we're providing aligns with what this person has identified as being most important. Uh, the challenge comes in figuring that out, right? Because now we're looking at, well, this was from 2018 and this is from 2015, but that one's from 2008, but the eight, they didn't update that one. So it becomes really a challenge just in terms of implementing um, what you want and coming up with a plan of care that is appropriate. And, and it takes a lot of time. And honestly, I, I couldn't guarantee that people would would have the resources within every hospital to be able to tease it out that, you know, to the to that level of minutia. The other thing is the law is pretty clear too that it says if you want to make changes, you got to complete a new form. Um, and I think because even there, they recognize that you can't in interpret or implement something that's that's unclear. So the whole goal is really just to make it easy to implement, easy to understand, so that ultimately the end person, the person whose document it is, is getting what they want, and we're avoiding doing things that they don't want. We're ready for the next slide. Any other questions 
about documentation? Nope. I don't see any hands. Do you, Tone? Nope. <laughs> oh, I do see a hand now. Go, uh, go ahead, Janice. Can she, do I have to tell her to open? Um, I don't know. If you can okay. unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. Okay. So my question is because I, I never really see things black and white. I always see gray. And so it seems like it makes it very difficult to come to all these conclusions. So once I get to that point, say at 75, this is what I want, X, Y, Z care. Can I say I want this until I am, say, 100? And then after 100, Deanna, or no, I'm just picking that age out of the air. But is that ever possible to do? Um, I guess I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to tackle that one. It might seem really silly, but I, I just, it keeps going through my mind. Like what I feel now and what I would want for myself when I'm 100, say 90, are two different things. I totally agree with you. And I think what we're, what you're reflecting is kind of the reality that legal documents that are these like <laughs> two dimensional things that you, you answer and sign are not as easily translated into what is the gray of medicine, right? I mean, medicine is very gray in general. We, they seldom speak in certainties. Um, it's very difficult to, um, to even prognosticate with any level of accuracy. I mean, there have been studies done where doctors, especially if they know the patient well, they've cared for them for a number of years, they tend to overestimate people's life expectancy by as much as 300%. So they are optimistic, right? Overly optimistic in many instances, which makes it tough to plan if someone thinks you're going to have... So you'll. we tend to not tend to give advice around worrying about that maybe you don't have as much time as you would like. Or I ask questions when I'm in, at the bedside with physicians, uh, what are you thinking? Days to weeks, weeks to months, months to years, you know what I mean, in terms of someone's prognosis, because it's very difficult to, to do that with any level of certainty. So I think when you think about doing these documents, I think it's difficult to project much more beyond probably the next five to 10 years. I think if you're trying to project out much farther than that, it's going to be pretty unclear because I think as um, Luann had kind of highlighted a little bit is, you know, when I'm 20, what I think will be an unacceptable state of being may feel really totally okay when I'm 60, right? I mean, like, you know, because we, we, we age, we lose things in maybe increments, not in huge chunks. And so we normalize to a new way of living. So and the other thing is if there's uncertainty, I think advanced directives are really good tools when there's uncertainty because you can say trial courses of treatment, time limited trials, and you can help uh, the, a physician is a really good resource to be like, okay, well, what's a reasonable trial? Like I couldn't say it's five days reasonable. I don't want to, I don't want my document to have that level of specificity because what if on the sixth day, that was really the point that we needed? You know, so I guess time limited trials, which I think signals to someone who's looking at that document, you're willing to do some things, but but not it can't be the plan for long term. Right. You're willing to try a few things to see if you'll get better and you're going to let the clinical team kind of do the evaluation of when we think whether or not we think this is working. Right. You're trying something. The clinical team will look for signs that this is helping or it's not helping. And once we know whether it's helping or not helping, then we can, that's another decision point, right? Um, I think a lot of times we don't know. We just don't know in medicine. A lot of times you come, some person comes into the emergency room. We don't know if their problem's fixable. We don't know because we don't have enough information. So it could be that we need to do some things just to get enough information to figure out what's going on and then to be able to make a plan. So advanced directives, I think, should contemplate those kind of uncertainties to some degree, but they also should con contemplate the inevitables as well, which means we will eventually all die. So what, what is important then when, that, when death is inevitable? 
right? So I think we'll talk a little bit more about the pitfalls of, and, and when you're completing documents to try to strike that balance, right? Between giving information about when we're in the land of uncertainty and also when we're in the land of inevitability. Like, wh what do we do then? Because it could be that we have very different plans depending upon what's achievable. Um, Paul said, um, is it wise to choose an agent who lives far away? I think it's fine as long as the person is accessible. I think COVID, if nothing else, has taught us to be incredibly uh, creative with how we communicate with loved ones um, and people who are in the position of making decisions for others. We were doing this before, but I think we've gotten better at it since COVID. Um, so there's no requirement that the person live close by. There's no requirement that they be in the same state as you, but there is a requirement that they be willing to serve and accessible and available when the team needs them. So I think we had a question recently about somebody being in another time zone. I think they said Australia. Like, I mean, I'm talking a seriously different time zone. So that may be practically challenging because it may be the middle of the night when it's the daytime here and it may be difficult to access that person. So I just say, think about accessibility, availability, um, how quickly can they be, you know, can, can they be reached to be able to help navigate decision-making? Um, and, if, and if they live in another state, but they're readily available, I'd say they, and they know you well, and they're willing to serve and you think they can be a good advocate, there's no reason to not have them be listed as your healthcare agent. All right, do we wanna move on to DNR? Yeah. I know that we had some questions about this. Um, so I'll just introduce this to say that advanced directives like we spoke about earlier are, are very much if then documents, right? If this happens, then I would want you to do this. If that happens, I would want you to do that. Um, and there may be very many circumstances where you think, well, I would like to try something or we could do this for a short period, just like Cindy was mentioning before. There's a lot of gray areas. But if you're looking at your advanced directive or you're looking at any document and you're thinking, I would never, ever, ever, ever under any circumstances want you to do this thing to me, right? Maybe that's CPR. That's probably the most common one that people think about this in the context of, right? I would never ever want anyone to try to resuscitate me. When my heart stops, that is my time, I am done. If that's how you feel when presented with some choice about your care, that this is an absolutely never kind of situation or an absolutely always kind of situation, uh, then it may be appropriate to consider a DNR order or a COLST order where these are medical orders that say, always this is the step we will or will not take, right? A DNR order means do not resuscitate under any circumstances, do not resuscitate them. And it is the only document that EMS personnel will look for to follow to instruct your emergent care if, for example, someone were to call 911. So at we on the continuum that we spoke about earlier, these are the kinds of documents that really are completed much later in the process, right? When you're thinking, absolutely not, I would never want you to try this under any circumstance, then it's appropriate to speak to your doctor about implementing these kinds of orders. But I think the thing that's most important is that these are not like advanced directives where you can complete them with witnesses. This is a medical order signed by your clinician. You must speak with your doctor to have this completed. It's not possible to do this without the consent of a physician. And, and I'll let Cindy speak a little bit more to how this is um, practically utilized. Can I just mention something about that? Um, I had do not resuscitate and I was quite firm about that. And, you know, I'm quote, perfectly healthy, but my doctor said, um, suppose you collapsed right now, would you not want to be resuscitated? So I had to really think about that. And, um, and so I, I changed it and I modified um, my advanced directive so that they know when to and when not to. And the other thing is, uh, I've spoken to a lot of people about having the do not resuscitate bracelet. And are you going to address that? Okay, okay. because a lot of people didn't have no idea about the Coles form or the bracelet. So I'll let you speak to that. Thank you. 
Sure. So Vermont has these uh, forms that Taylor has, has just highlighted here. They're, they're basically called portable orders, right? They're intended to move with a person as they move around, right? Whether they're in the hospital or whether they're in the community or in a long-term care setting, these, these orders can move around with them. Um, but as Taylor highlighted, these are not advanced directives, although they are a tool in our advanced care planning process, but they're medical orders, right? So they have to be completed by a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant, and someone, either you, the individual whose order it is, or your healthcare agent needs to consent for it. So it does require informed consent, which is why we need to have that clinician talking to the individual or their decision maker about what it means to say no to these things. Um, and this is the tool that EMS is looking for. When 911 gets called to someone's home or to a long-term care setting, um, they want it the only way they're going to withhold CPR, which is probably the most urgent thing because CPR, the standards for EMS are to assess for pulselessness and they have to initiate compressions within 10 seconds um, if the person is without a pulse. So you can imagine that's not a lot of time to read through a complicated if then kind of 10 page advanced directive document. They would never even get past the first page. They need, um, they need a document that makes it clear, and this is probably one of the more black and white situations, do or do not do. If, we, if they don't see this order or find this order, and, and as Luann pointed out, or a DNR identification that serves in place of this order um, that you can wear as a bracelet, they're gonna initiate CPR because the assumption is rescue, we rescue people who have an emergent health crisis like their heart stopping. Um, unless we know for a fact this was expected and we're not going to be doing this. The person anticipated that this might happen to them and they made a choice in advance not to have the standard of care, which is to a try to rescue you, um, applied. So that's why they're looking for it. Um, the thing about these documents is once you complete one, or once your physician completes one with you, if this is appropriate for you, and I would say this is generally for people, and I think Luann highlighted why it's challenging for people who are, are younger or relatively healthy, because it's like, are you sure you're, there's no circumstance in which you would want to be resuscitated? So if, um, if, if that is in your thinking, which it sounds like it was for Luann, she had to think about it, then a good advanced directive that kind of outlines what your wishes are is what you need. However, if you're one of those people, and I always use my husband's grandmother because she was so clear about it. She was in her 90s and she said, when, it's, when he calls, I'm ready. She said, I've, I've buried two of my children and my husband. I'm ready anytime. This is not the way the order of the world was supposed to happen. And so when it's time, when it's her time, it's her time. And she doesn't want any of it. She doesn't want any tubes, wires, machines, nothing. That was her choice. And so she's a person that needed to have one of these orders. She lived alone. She lived by herself. She was in her 90s. And she needed to have an order like this that was readily available on her refrigerator. So should she get a call from 911 um, and someone stopped by and found her unresponsive, they would know exactly what not to do and what they should do. Um, keep in mind that these only apply to certain things, right? Having one of these orders doesn't mean you can't call 911. It doesn't mean you can't go to the hospital. It just means that if your heart stops, we're not going, to, and you died, essentially, we're not going to try to, to get, a, get a heartbeat again. We're going to allow this person a natural death. Um, and that's really the goal of these orders. So if you have one of these orders that's been signed by your clinician, it's a valid order on the appropriate Vermont DNR COLST form. You can then go to the Department of Health website and obtain a DNR identification. There are a couple of vendors there, Medical Alert being one of them. Sticky J, I believe, is the name of the other vendor, where you can then submit a copy of your order and they can send you an appropriate approved, Vermont approved DNR identification, which EMS will honor the same as they would as if they saw this paper order on your refrigerator. So hopefully, oh. Um, let's see, I just saw a comment in the chat that popped up. Oops, why is it not letting me see? There we go. Um, an excellent book by a palliative care physician, Jessica Zider, 
uh, extreme measures, finding a better path to the end of life. Parts of the book that I found most fascinating were her explanations of medical training and how physicians really haven't been ha taught how to support people to die. Their sole focus is on curing and treating illness. It's so true. But we're doing a lot, I think, in Vermont and elsewhere to, to change that and to make sure that people are recognizing what Dr. Gawande said at the outset, which is death is inevitable. So how do we ensure that we support people when they're there? So I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about, um, I can provide these slides if that's helpful. Um, at the end of the training, I can send an email so you guys can have copies of them for references. But just quickly, the difference between the two advanced directives, preference-based documents that only somebody can complete for themselves, cold orders, these are medical orders completed by a physician. Advanced directive is more future-oriented, but DNRs guide in the moment decisions, what we're gonna do right now. So I just wanna highlight that. And then the pitfalls. I wanna make sure I just quickly go, and you're, as you're completing these documents, <laughs> um, they're not just for end of life, right? They're for any time when you can't make decisions for yourself, which could be temporary. So it'll be used um, by the care team when we're not, even when we don't know what the outcome's gonna be yet to guide some decisions. And so it's important to think about, are there some things that you might not be willing to do just to get more time to try to recover? What does recovery mean to you? Um, are there things you're willing to do to get more time? Just sort of think of, think, think about those kinds of questions. What are your priorities and what are your limits? Um, I think a lot of advanced directives are not super helpful because they don't really speak to your values. They only speak to specific treatments, which may not apply depending on the circumstance you're in. And we, as we said, there's no crystal ball. So are there any circumstances or conditions that would be unacceptable to you? Um, and what would you be willing to go through to have more time? And then be mindful of contradictions, right? Some things and some things that goals may be incompatible with certain treatments. Like my case earlier, the, the person who didn't want to go to the hospital. Well, it would make no sense to have an advanced directive that says, you know, perform CPR and intubate me if my ultimate goal is not to go to the hospital, right? Those are not compatible. In order for us to do one, we're going to violate the other. So um, be thinking about that. And make sure you talk with your doctor or nurse about medical circumstances that you could encounter in the future. I think um, our earlier conversation with Luann was, was really illustrative of how important it is to have those conversations and to be thinking about what's coming and to be able to make plans in advance. All right, we're running a hair over, Taylor, but I just want to make sure you have... Yeah, absolutely. And, and if, if you need to hop off, Cindy, that's fine. This is... Now back into my wheelhouse of what to do once you have a document. And I think directly to Martha's question earlier about, okay, so I did it, but uh, how do we know that anyone is ever going to find it or use it? So here's what we recommend. Um, once you have a completed directive, make copies. D make, don't make two, make seven, make 10 copies because you want other people to have copies of your document. You should hold on to the original for yourself, right? So you can make more copies <laughs> if you need to. But also give these copies out to people. Give, if there's someone listed in your directive as a healthcare agent, they need a copy. If you know that your family members are going to come to the hospital, even if they're not your agent, they need a copy. If you have any family, relevant family and friends who are going to be involved in your care, they need a copy because they should know the plan. Your doctor needs a copy because they should definitely know the plan. And if you have a local hospital where you think, yep, if something happened, they would take me there. Um, or I already go to Dartmouth for regular treatments, or I already go to Copley for my annual whatevers, you know, they need a copy as well. They have a medical file for you already. And so keeping a copy of your directive on file is just another way to make sure that people who will be involved in your care have the resources to give you good care. And then the next thing that you can do, which I personally will champion for everyone here, is send a copy to the Vermont Advanced Directive Registry. And I'm, I have a whole, ne the next slide is to talk about the registry. So if you don't know what it is, the registry is a secure online database where Vermonters can store their advanced directive documents for free. Um, it's immediate access for providers. You have to be an authorized user to go and search for someone's document, which means doctors and hospitals um, pretty much exclusively. So 
Authorized personnel can access your document at any time, even if they're out of state, even if something happens to you in Florida, they can find your directive in the registry and they can honor your directive because they have, are able to see it. Um, and you'll also get an annual reminder that lets you know, hey, you still have a document in the registry, which is a great opportunity to revisit your document and make sure it still represents what you want to have happen to you. And then when you do this, when you submit a document to the registry, it does involve one additional form, which I know is a shame, <laughs> but it is required. Um, the first time it's called the registration agreement when you submit for the first time. And then for any future changes, whether you're submitting an entirely new document or adding an addendum, you need what's called an authorization to change form. And recently we've combined these into one document, so it's impossible not to have both. Um, but this is required when submitting documents to the registry and um, on our website, all these resources are there. But the registry is another way, putting your document in the registry is another way to make sure that regardless of where you are or who's giving you your care in that moment, they can find your document um, the registry provides you with a wallet ID card that you can carry, which is much easier than carrying your entire advanced directive around in your back pocket. So these are some steps we recommend to make sure your document is accessible, but I'm happy to stay here and answer any questions about the registry um, as well. And then, and then this is sort of an overview of the resources that we have on our website. Um, starting from just appointing a healthcare agent all the way to considering DNR COLST orders. Um, we can provide you with any of these resources if you'd like them mailed directly to you. Um, and then we even have a resource that we can provide to agents, um, or you may be interested to read if you're an agent yourself, um, about making medical decisions for others. Um, go ahead, Cindy. Yeah, I just wanted to um, highlight that all hospitals in Vermont are authorized users of the registry. And under Vermont law, they're required to check the registry when a person comes in who lacks capacity. So they have to look <laughs> to see if you have a document. Will I say that there are times when they don't look? Yep. And we are working on that. Um, we are working on making sure that the systems are, um, are happening and it's kind of hardwired into their workflows. I think we've had a lot of changes to people's electron to the hospital electronic medical records recently, and they've had a lot of updates. And so some of their systems have kind of gone, gotten a little out of whack, but we're, we're getting them back online again and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So part of my work through the ethics network is to work with hospital facility or hospitals and other types of healthcare facilities to make sure that they are um, have access to the registry if they need it or want it. Certainly the hospitals have to have it and to make sure that those systems are in place so that when you're doing all this hard work of talking to people and documenting your wishes, that when it's most needed, they're checking and looking for these documents. I still think that it is all technologically based. Systems go offline periodically, we have issues. That's why we still recommend making multiple copies and making sure all the relevant people have a copy just in case. It's also for you on your documents, you can document who you've given copies to. And that I think is also helpful because then if you're, when you're making changes, you can look at your original and say, gee, all these people got a copy last time. I wanna make sure they all get a copy again. So people are all in the loop with what you're doing. So I think we'll stop there. And do people have any additional questions? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can actually see all of your faces. I'm not sure if people had any additional questions or comments, and hopefully, I think we answered everything um, about how to find papers. So, if you do documents with an attorney and you're not using Vermont Ethics Network forms, which is entirely fine, um, make sure that you still, if you want to submit, you should submit that we can still submit those documents to the registry. But you're going to need that authorization, that combined authorization to change form to submit them. We work with a, a number of attorneys across the state as well, and I've, I have done CLE legal education for the Vermont Bar Association over the years, so they should know how to do it. But you can access those forms on our website, but make sure you can submit any, any advanced directive. It doesn't have to be our form to the registry, but you've got to use that registration agreement. So I guess, if Martha, if you're using documents completed by an attorney, just get a registration agreement and you can send it to the registry that way. You've actually done. 
All right. Any other, other questions or comments? Well, Amy says thank you. So thank you, Amy, for joining us. Uh, it was always great to share this information with people. Um, it can feel really daunting. And we hope that maybe this feels a little less daunting and a little more empowering now um, to have more information. And we are always a resource. Um, and I know that Martha has our contact information, but if you would like to get forms from us, I mail forms out every single day. I have a stack right here ready to go. Um, so if you need forms or resources, we are always available to do that. As well. Thank well, thanks you. So that's much. very helpful. Sure. Martha, do you want me to send you a copy of the slides and you can certainly make them available to other people? Would that be helpful? Yes. Okay, we can do that. Uh, did you say you were recording this earlier? Oh, yes. Oh, I think yes. you muted. Yeah. Yes, it is. It has been recorded. And how would we be able to get a copy of that recording? You'll get the link. Uh, it'll be in our newsletter, but uh, I have... Some of you don't receive the Senior Center newsletter, which goes out every week, but I can send you the link as soon as it's ready to those that uh, registered for today's program. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much, you. everyone. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you.